The Devil Summoner series is arguably the most badass, stylish thing to come out of Megaton. No matter which game you choose, from the fast-paced Raido Kuzunoha games to the cyberpunk dungeon crawler Soul Hackers, you'll be able to tell right away that a ton of effort went into creating a truly unique set of characters with an equally engaging world. Perhaps some of the most interesting characters and environments are featured in the very first game in the series, simply titled Devil Summoner. Released originally in 1995 for the Sega Saturn and later getting a remake in 2005 for the PSP, Devil Summoner is a bit of an enigma for the English-speaking Megaten community in that it has yet to receive an official translation or a fan translation patch. Amongst a sea of obscure, untranslated JRPGs, Devil Summoner unfortunately continues to slip through the cracks, and as such, not too many people have bothered to play it. The only option, short of learning Japanese, is to follow along with an English script. Whether you're a new fan wanting to start the series from the beginning, or a veteran who wants to jump back in with something a little more obscure, you may be wondering. Past the language barrier, is this game worth playing? Does it hold up to more modern entries in the series? And is it really that unique compared to something like the mainline titles? Well, we're going to answer all those questions as we take a dive through each of the main dungeons and major story points, in addition to in-depth discussion of the game's mechanics and atmosphere. This is going to be a bit of a journey, but discussion of this game is few and far between online, and I think I owe it to you guys to be as comprehensive as possible and provide a complete picture of the Devil Summoner experience. Now before we get started, I'd like to note that I'll be talking about the PSP version of the game. Among other quality of life improvements, this release adds a demon compendium, something that, considering negotiations are untranslated, is quite a big help to someone such as myself who is not fluent in Japanese. This is the version I'd personally recommend if you want to try the game out. Though the soundtrack is much clearer and better sounding on the Saturn, the PSP version ultimately provides a better game for English speakers. With that out of the way, let's get to it. The game opens up to the tune of a radio broadcast discussing the recent appearance of demons across town. People are feeling kind of on edge these days, and well, before long we'll find out exactly why that is. When the cutscene ends, you're immediately presented with a membership form for DDSnet. Unlike most other Megami Tensei games, Devil Summoner gives you a decent amount of freedom in terms of role-playing options for your character. Here, we get to choose our full name, code name, hometown, and even occupation. I thought this was pretty cool, and even though it's mostly pointless, I had some fun with it. For my occupation, I chose student, but you could also be an office worker or even unemployed, for example. When you're done creating your character, an AI named Redman introduces you to the town, the Asahi District of Hirasaka City. He makes sure to let you know how great the place is before quickly adding in at the very end that a Yakuza boss used to live in the area. And then he immediately ends the conversation. Okay then. Well, after this you meet your parents and you briefly talk to your girlfriend Kumiko on the phone. She wants to meet you at the Seaside Park District and you decide on a place called the Afro Cafe. Now if you're like me and can barely read, the second you land on this chunky ass 3D map is right where the game starts to get interesting. It can feel a little intimidating navigating this place without really knowing what anything says. I mean shit, you might as well actually be running around Japan, right? If you follow along with the English script, odds are you'll be fine, but sometimes it can be fun to deviate and explore a bit, even though I usually end up being verbally assaulted by a young couple in the street or something. Eventually, you make it to the cafe, and you just kind of chill there for a while as you wait for Kumiko to show up. This is one of the first places where the atmosphere of the game really starts to catch you. If you're into the whole detective story vibe, you're going to find a lot to like about this game's presentation. You go into this empty bar, sit down, the TV's playing in the background, and you order a drink from the bartender. It's some comfy shit, and it even feels a little nostalgic, but also faintly mysterious. Eventually Kumiko shows up, and I gotta say, I love the design here. She's got that intelligent, classy look. You're gonna hear me shit my pants a lot about the character designs in this game, but to me, they're just that cool. There are so many unique characters and NPCs in this game compared to a lot of other games in Megami Tensei, and I think a large part of that is because, well, this isn't really an apocalyptic story. Things don't have to be so drab or depressing, and it's a great change of pace if you're coming off of a game like Nocturne or Strange Journey. 
After a bit of dialogue, the two of you head off to the library to get a book she needs to write a report. Here you get a little taste of the first person navigation, and you also get to answer some other questions from Kumiko that serve to determine your starting character stats. After you find the book, you make a quick stop at the university, and you part ways with Kumiko while she goes to meet her professor. While we're waiting, she asks if we can pick up some concert tickets at the Yakigashi building. Now if you thought the whole doing chores with your girlfriend thing was getting old, don't worry. As soon as you walk into this place, demons pop out, and they're this close to eating your ass before the man himself busts in, Kyoji Kuzanoha, owner of the Kuzanoha Detective Agency. He beats the actual shit out of these guys and then proceeds to call you a total dumbass. Yeah, Kyoji's kind of a dick, but I guess when you're a demon slaying detective, you can do whatever you want. From here, Kyoji says it's either go with him or die, and then he literally pulls you through the dungeon. You have absolutely no control over the next two or three minutes. Lucky for us, we get to level up a few times without any effort though, so let's take advantage of that. For a second, let's talk about stats. There's a few you're going to want to focus on for your character. Starting from the top, we have Strength, Intelligence, Magic, Vitality, Agility, and Luck. A solid strategy is just to allocate points to Strength, Vitality, and Agility. Much like other games in the series, the main character can't use magic, so a few of these stats are pretty much irrelevant. Feel free to pump a few points into luck or something if you want, but if you stick with the main three I listed, you'll be fine. Soon enough, you reach the top, and you meet this crazy looking vampire guy named Takashi. He and Kyoji spend a little while insulting each other, and then it's a total curb stomp as Kyoji just obliterates this guy's minions. For you, that was some crazy shit. But for Kyoji, it was just a Monday. And with that, you head downstairs and get ready to leave. On your way out, you meet Rei Reiho, Kyoji's partner. Again, her design is pretty simple, but I can't help but love it. It kinda reminds me of Yumi from Shin Megami Tensei If, in a way. She's really confident looking. I think it's the hair? I don't know. We'll be seeing Rei a lot more in the future, but for now, it's back to our normal student life. Once you get back to the cafe, like literally as soon as you walk into the door, you see a news announcement that Kyoji Kuzunoha was found dead and authorities are investigating the incident. What the fuck dude? It's been like 5 seconds top since we last saw that guy. I mean what the hell happened? Did he trip over his massive dick and balls while he was walking to his car? I mean, rest in peace I guess. Anyway, so the bartender lets you know that Kumiko went home and we can just take the tickets to her there. On the way back, you meet this totally not suspicious guy in the street named Sid. Well, one thing leads to another, and he sucks your soul out in the middle of a warehouse. Yeah, you're fucking dead too. Turns out, that book we got at the library for Kumiko earlier might be a little more than we thought it was, and Sid wants it. You do a brief stint in the afterlife where you meet Sharon, and he says that at the moment, our body is unavailable. However, there is a substitute we can use. Can you guess what's about to happen? Yeah, that's right. We wake up in the hospital, and now we're Kyoji. Aw, oh, shit. From here, the game finally starts to really open up, and you've got a lot more freedom. This little enclosed mall place is where we'll be spending a good bit of time throughout the game, and I highly encourage you to check out all the stores. This place seems innocent enough, but it's dripping with atmosphere inside these buildings. You can walk into a club and gather information, or hit up a bar and order some drinks while you ask around about what to do next. If you want to heal up, instead of a recovery spring or a terminal or something, you go into this gym and a guy rushes you into a back room where you can get patched up. There's a real estate place that's a front for a weapons store, and this guy pushes a button and the shelves and shit turn around filled with weapons. I love the transition this game takes, from feeling like a vulnerable student living in some dark evil world to actually being the powerful summoner who uncovers those secrets. When you're ready, visit Maria in the building across from the detective agency. You're going to be seeing a lot of Maria. She's the one who hands out jobs for us to do. Funnily enough, she complains briefly about a poltergeist problem, and then Kyoji's ghost flies in, and as you might imagine, he's kind of pissed off. He threatens to send you to the 8th circle of hell if you get even a scratch on his body, so uh, let's keep that in mind and be careful. Anyway, our first job for Maria is to take care of a little demon problem at a library that just so happens to be the same one from earlier. Now before we get really started discussing each of this game's dungeons, keep in mind that unlike other games I've reviewed on this channel, where there's like 5 or 6 long, challenging dungeons, Devil Summoner is a bit different. 
There are over 15 dungeons in this game, many of which are quite short. As you'll see, each one tends to add more obstacles and traps, and by the end, the dungeons are sprawling shit pits that you can really get lost in. One thing I like about this is that it makes the gameplay a bit more digestible, and that you can clear dungeon in about 20 minutes and then take a break, satisfied that you've made some progress. This is a sharp contrast to, say, the world of Sloth in Shin Megami Tensei IF, where I spent about four hours wanting to tear my eyes out. With this in mind, the first dungeon, the library, is a short but sweet introduction to the core mechanics of the game. The library is a simple climb to the top. No tricks here, the rooms are small, and the demons are weak. You'll notice many demons go down in just one hit, and for the most part, attacking everything you see with your sword is more than enough to get through this place. The combat in Devil Summoner uses a row system, so people in the front row are the ones fighting it out with all their attacks and taking the hits, while the guys in the back support you with spells and special moves. Not as exciting as something like press turn, but it gets the job done, and usually it doesn't last that long. Battles tend to be quick, and overall I think it feels pretty good. I've heard some say the combat feels slow, and to be fair I did button mash my way through a lot of those battle messages, but if you played some other old school Mega 10 games, I don't think it's really that bad. So you're going along kicking some demon ass, right? Eventually you think, hey, you know, it'd be nice to have some extra team members, I mean this is Devil's Summoner after all. Well, negotiation is our first big roadblock, and though it gets easier down the line, I found it to be incredibly tedious and difficult in the first handful of dungeons. Unless you're pretty solid on Japanese, it's just going to be tough, there's no way around it. The English script for this game has few references to negotiation, so by and large, you're on your own. I mean, check this out, I'm talking to this pixie for like 3 hours, okay? She's told me her entire life story, and asked me every question under the sun. I even get to the point where she asks me for items. You know, I'm not a cheap guy, so I'm laying down the fat stacks, like 5,000 maka just for this one pixie. And she fucking runs away! You might be thinking, alright Marsh, why don't you just pull your head out of your ass and try again? Well I did, for about 45 minutes, and I wasn't able to recruit a single demon. Each demon has a particular personality type, and if you can play into that with the responses, supposedly that makes it a bit easier. Now either I have the shittiest luck on the entire planet, or I'm just really stupid, but I just could not make this work. Eventually, I just got bored of it, and I decided to gather all of my big dick energy to beat the boss without any demons, totally solo. It's what Kyoji would've wanted. Well to my surprise, it actually worked. The boss is called Fugaruma, and basically her only dangerous moves are a fire spell and a sleeping spell. If you get hit by the sleeping spell, you're fucked, because without any demons, there's nobody to save you. But, I lucked out once, and I was able to win with some healing by life stones and beads that had dropped from random encounters. Not too bad, but so much for being a devil summoner. Now don't worry, we'll get into summoning later, but for a while, being unable to get even a pixie to join me was kinda like a running joke. With that job complete, we can head back to Maria and get our pay of 50,000 maka. Make sure you use this to heal up and upgrade your equipment. If your luck is as bad as mine, equipment is really going to come in handy when you have no demons to rely on. After this, we take a quick detour. Uh, you didn't forget about Rei, right? She joins up with us, and we decide to head up to a shrine to ask the gods for some extra power. This part is pretty cool. Essentially, Rei can choose one blessing to receive. Amaterasu, who sets up Rei to be an offensive magic caster. Gabriel, who is a buffing and support build and Ishtar, who sets her up with a healing build. I love this choice, I thought this was pretty neat. Honestly, it gives you a reason to run back through the game a couple of times and test out each one. I ended up going with Amaterasu. I figured if recruiting demons is going to be a problem, it's going to be nice to have some guaranteed powerful attack spells whenever I need them. As for what you pick, well, it's up to you. I've heard Ishtar is kind of underwhelming since you can just use beads or lifestones for healing, but feel free to try out whichever one you want. From here, Ray tells us about a chance to investigate Professor Azuma, who lives close to where the game first started in our home district. It doesn't take long before you notice that the surrounding area turned into hell on earth, and with that, we're in our second main dungeon. Ray with offensive magic, complemented by a powerful physical build on your main character, basically lets you run around blowing fuckers away. This dungeon is actually a bit easier than the first. 
There's still no traps or warps or anything to be worried about, just a larger area to explore. Regardless of which build you chose, Ray can heal you with a basic spell and provides reliable backup. If you chose the offense build, experiment with elemental weaknesses. You start off with a fire and ice spell, and you can really speed through encounters with proper exploitation of weaknesses. Soon enough you make it to the boss, who's actually a bit out of the ordinary. Remember this dude from earlier, Takashi? Well, he's back, he's pissed off, and he sticks a squad of demons onto you. What makes this fight so interesting is that you don't actually have to win it, but you can't lose it either. You have to hold out for 8 turns. If you kill all the enemies before that, you get a different cutscene and the full battle rewards. But if not, well, you still get to continue. It's not super hard if you spend some time leveling up, but don't worry about it too much either way. No matter what happens, as soon as it's over, Takashi pulls like a cord on his chest or some shit and the entire building is absolutely fucking obliterated. Thanks Takashi. Somehow you make it out, but the cops show up and arrest you, because apparently, Kyoji's always the one standing around when this kind of thing happens. Kyoji's ghost even takes a second to laugh at us in jail, but then we get bailed out by Maria and it's back to work. Well, you know the drill. Upgrade your equipment, buy some items. You might have to rely on Google Translate for this kind of thing. I don't think it's really in the guide. In my case, it was pretty simple because I've been studying the language for a couple of years, but this obviously isn't the case for everybody. If all else fails, when you're buying equipment, just pay attention as to whether it's male or female equipment, and make sure the numbers on the left are indicating a stat increase. The third dungeon takes place in a building called Casa Inui. There's not much to say about this one to be honest, it's just a really brief level and you'll beat it pretty fast. The boss, however, is a bit more challenging than what we've seen so far. When you get to the end, you roll up on this ghost soldier guy, and then a whole squad of them pop out and it's game on. They're actually weak to fire, so if you have any fire moves, whether it's from Ray or demons you recruited, go all out and beat them as quick as possible. When these guys get low on health, they can cast a special move called Cherry Blossom that does a high amount of damage while also killing the caster. It's basically like a last resort suicide type move, but if more than one of these guys does it before you get a chance to heal, you're probably going to die. As you can see, I still wasn't able to recruit a demon, but that didn't stop me from beating the fight anyway. It's a bump up in challenge to be sure, but still not too hard as long as you're fast with your attacks and keep your health high enough to survive at least one cast of Cherry Blossom. After this, we get paid again, and then it's time to investigate Kitayama University at Ray's request. This is the place we took Kumiko earlier, so you might remember where it is. If you try to go in through the front, all the cops take turns calling you a piece of shit, so you need to go in through the back. This is the first dungeon I'd consider to be lengthy. While you can beat the others in about 5 minutes, this one has two moderately sized sections to work your way through. After a while, you make it to the doors of the university, and the dungeon opens up a bit more as you now have to navigate a handful of floors. Welp, this is where it finally happened. Yup. After a conversation with this pig that lasted several hours and the loss of thousands of maka, I finally got my first demon. Let's fucking go. Alright, now we can finally talk about a unique feature this game has regarding demons. The loyalty system. Whereas in other games, you go through the negotiation process and from then on the demon does whatever you say, in this game you have to tickle their balls a little bit before they'll listen to you. You see that bar below the HP and MP? That's the loyalty bar. Most demons start out with just one loyalty, which means if you ask it to like attack the guy that's about to murder you, it'll do something else, or maybe even totally refuse and just do nothing. Each demon has its own way of increasing loyalty. Some just become more loyal as you use them in battle, some want you to give them gifts, and some get more loyal the higher your level goes. There are some demons you can get that start at level 10 loyalty, but for the most part, everything you recruit is going to start off at 1. Now even if you have, say, 5 loyalty, that doesn't mean you can pick the move that you want your demons to use. Nope. You slowly work your way up. Initially, all you can say is go, which could mean anything, and then you can specify offense or defense, and eventually you can finally just pick the moves you want to use. So yeah, not only can they be tough to recruit, but you also have to put in the work to actually make them listen. Kind of interesting, but depending on what their requirements are for getting loyalty, it can become annoying. 
So after this, I eventually made it to the boss door. One thing you can do before going in the boss door is walk past it, and after an extremely long, twisty hallway, you end up meeting this goblin-looking ass nerd in the basement. He makes you fight a pretty simple little boss, and then you get this item, a weird doll. We'll use this later. You don't have to do this part, it's optional, but you might as well while you're here. Anyway, the real boss of this place is our old friend Sid. Gotta love him. So this is yet another fight that you don't have to win, and in fact, I didn't win it. You just have to hold out for 8 turns again. Be careful, try to keep your health up, because once he leaves, you have to fight Shiki Oji. He's not that hard, but he can reflect physical attacks with Tetracarn, so watch out for that. All in all, a pretty simple boss encounter, especially if you have some demons to take some hits for you. After this, Rei starts to realize that you aren't actually Kyoji, and she's a little suspicious of you. But she's still your partner, and I guess that's gonna have to be good enough for now. From here, you can start to explore the sewers. These are optional, and there's actually four different sewers that progressively open up throughout the game. I don't really like these that much, they're just like dark, boring little extra dungeon crawls for you to do. They aren't any more challenging than normal dungeons, in fact they felt a little easier. You can encounter some silly events down here though, like a little thing with Jack Frost and Pyro Jack, so it's not all bad at least. You can also have some recurring battles with that nerd guy from the university. His name's Dr. Thrill by the way, and he'll give you some progressively difficult bosses to fight against. Even then, they aren't super hard. Keep the sewers in mind for a bit. I'm gonna bring them up again later. There's actually a shop at the bottom of the first sewer you unlock, but you're not allowed in without an ID card that you don't get for quite a while. Now might be a good time to get acquainted with the demon fusion process. You get a lot of options here. It can look kind of intimidating with all the text, but it's not so bad. So that item we got earlier from the extra boss at the university, you can use that here, it gives you this thing called a Dolly Cadman. You can fuse things called Zoma Demons with it. Essentially, you fuse one or two demons with the doll, and you'll be able to get a special demon. Zoma Demons always have 10 loyalty, so you might want to check it out. For now, all I can really fuse is a she saw, and he kind of sucks ass, but hey, I guess it's something. Our next job is at Kasagi Manor, and this is the first place we're going to find warps and pitfalls. Our favorite. Fortunately for us, it's not too bad. Yet. There's an item you can find in here called a stinger. This thing is nice, it makes the boss pretty trivial. You'll see how in a minute. You get to the top floor and you have to fight Kashiyama and six Enku demons. Well, I didn't have any backup for this one. She saw already shat the bed, so it's just me and Ray again. The stinger item does a pretty decent amount of damage to every enemy, so it'll heavily damage these Enku guys and outright kill a couple of them. From there, it's just clean up as you finish off each one, and then you go one on one with the boss. The hardest part is getting rid of these six guys, so once you've got that figured out, the rest is simple. Without going very far, we hit up Mount Kasagi next, which is basically next door. Supposedly, Professor Azuma lies deep within these woods. This dungeon is just another maze. Easy shit, not much to talk about. That is until you reach Azuma's hut where you have a pretty long conversation about what might be going wrong with the town. So, Azuma is being hunted. Kyoji was supposed to be his bodyguard, but uh, then he died, so Azuma has been hiding all the way out in the mountains. In ancient times, in this very city, there was a small country who fought against the Yamato dynasty using magic and demons to avoid being assimilated into the empire. Eventually, they couldn't fight anymore, and the country's princess was tortured and executed. Her anger and desire for revenge was sealed away long ago, but it looks like people like our friend Sid are trying to undo the seals and wreck some shit. Now remember that book we borrowed with Kumiko all the way back at the start? Yeah, so this guy wrote it, and Sid is after it, which is presumably why he killed us at the beginning. The only problem is, I didn't have it. Kumiko did. From here, we gotta bust ass and go save Kumiko. You go into the rich people's district of the town, Kibari Gawaka. And as you get close to Kumiko's house, you enter another nice hell dimension. I literally have nothing to say about this place because I actually finished it in about 10 seconds, no joke. It's a warp maze, but somehow I stepped on like two warps and I was already at the boss. I probably couldn't have done this dungeon faster even if I was looking at a map like straight off of game facts or something. It was honestly pretty fucking sick. So the boss is these two guys. 
and they're weak to fire so if you just blast them with fire spells they're gonna go down fast. They actually do have a little bit of a combo going on here where one's gonna try to hit you with an ailment while the other finishes you off, but if you go fast and hard with the attack, they'll stand basically no chance at all. After this, Kumiko's parents are losing their shit because she's like all kidnapped and stuff, but then in the distance emerges... Takashi? Yeah, I guess after his little suicide bomb stint, he became, um, a human being. And he saved Kumiko. Rei mentions that perhaps Kyoji's spirit stole Takashi's body, and she ditches you for a while to go check it out. Later, back at the detective agency, Rei tells you that Takashi looks to be extremely skilled, and that he's probably a better partner than you. Then, we get our next job from Marie. Demons are at Hikawa Shrine, and we've got to take care of it. Hikawa Shrine is another forest maze with warps, and these annoying floors that poison you and paralyze you. Make sure you come in here with some ailment curing items, or have a spell for it. It can really suck if you're paralyzed and you have to walk basically all the way out to fix it. One demon you can find in here is... Jesus? I guess it doesn't have to be Jesus, he's not the only person I've ever been crucified, but... Never seen this guy before, and that's because this game is the only one that he's in besides Card Summoner. Huh. So, there's no boss for this dungeon. At the end you meet Susano. He warns you that demons are overrunning the city, and that his power is weakening. Just as he's about to say something else, the sun comes out and he disappears. Classic. So where to go from here? Well, hopefully every so often you've been visiting Redmond, you know, the AI from the start. He offers you some general hints and little bits of dialogue about the world, and now he's going to help us with our next job. He mentions an art museum, and Ray thinks there's something suspicious about it, so we're going to investigate it. When you get there, the door is locked, but if you visit Redmond again, he can hack it open. So we're breaking into a public building then? As detectives? Shit, okay. So the art museum is a cool ass dungeon. I really like this one. There's a bit to talk about here. Close to the start, Ray gets turned into a statue by the demon Don Talion. So for this dungeon, you have to manage it by yourself. Hope you have a few demons or a nice supply of healing items because it can be kind of rough getting through this part as just Kyoji if you're not prepared. Try not to spend too much time in combat or else when you get Ray back, you'll have far surpassed her level since she isn't gaining any XP. The coolest gimmick of this dungeon is the ability to take paintings and other pieces of art with you. There are quite a few to collect scattered around the dungeon, and I recommend you find as many as possible. You can either keep it all the way to the end of the dungeon and sell it to a store after for big money, or you can use the art on the boss. Yeah, so check it out. You reach Dontalion and you gotta fight him without Ray. If you use the art pieces as items during the battle, you can take away his turns. So each piece you use makes him waste three turns, making this a fight you can easily solo. I practically soloed it here, I mean, as you can see, I have one demon, but it's just that pig that I got like six hours ago. So think about whether or not you need to use the art. Obviously, it can make for a very easy fight, but if you're able to face him without doing it, then you can rack up a huge amount of money when all is said and done. I love this gimmick, it was really cool, it's kind of like a reverse version of the Domain of Greed from Shin Megami Tensei If, and it really gives you a big incentive to explore the entire thing. After the fight, make sure you find Rei and bring her back to normal. Apparently, you can just leave the place without doing that, though I'm not sure if the game keeps going, or you just have to walk all the way back and find her to continue the story. Back in town, our next job isn't from Marie. We're moving up a little bit, and this one comes from Madame Ginko. Again, I love this. You go into this bar, and there's a bunch of people standing around, including a girl in bondage gear. You get ushered into this back room, and there she is. Madame Ginko is pretty quick and to the point, but she gives off this really mysterious vibe. She gives you this little pause before calling you Devil Summoner. I guess she understands that we're not really detectives then? Well alright. So our mission is to clear out a place called East Asia TV of Demons. Now East Asia TV is essentially a double dungeon. It connects to a radio tower, and you're gonna have to clear out both to complete this mission. This is a pretty lengthy dungeon, and filled with all of our favorites. Pitfalls, warps, you know, the fun stuff. I finally here managed to recruit something half decent, a power, so hell yeah, that beats the pig and the lion we had earlier. One demon in here is actually pretty fucking terrifying. 
You're just going around beating up the usual SMT demons you'd expect when suddenly this massive ass skeleton comes in. His name's Gasha Dokoro, and for the most part, he only exists in Devil Summoner games. This dungeon has a somewhat interesting gimmick. Somewhere in the East Asia TV building is a boss. Now, if you beat this boss, then the boss of the radio tower is weakened when you get to him. And the thing is, I didn't actually find the East Asia TV boss. That'll kinda come back to bite me in the ass here soon, so if you find yourself in here, make sure you find the first boss before you move on to the radio tower. After a while, you switch over and you enter a surprisingly futuristic looking tower. It's a pretty short section, but you still need to look out for pitfalls. The main event of this tower is the fucking boss. Look at this guy. This is Orgon Ghost, yet another demon that only appears in this game in Card Summoner. Alright, so what the fuck is an Orgon Ghost, right? Well, according to the wiki, he's based on Orgon Energy, which is supposedly this massless universal life force. Uh, and if you Google it, you get some pretty crazy shit, including a nearly $12,000 Orgon Generator. Yeah, so it's some kind of pseudoscience theory people are buying into, I guess? Really weird, but also an interesting idea for a demon. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if somewhere down the line, some shit like 5G towers became a demon. But anyway, so this guy's all hyped up and off his meds because I didn't kill the boss in East Asia TV. He's kinda hard, he has an instant kill move that sometimes he'll just straight up spam over and over. He can hit like a train too, especially if you don't have any buffs. Interestingly, he's weak to physical attacks. This is another one of those fights where you have to go as fast and hard as you can. Slam the shit out of this guy, do not stop, and you can make it through. That's how I did it. I actually got lucky with a big critical hit at the end that did around 400 damage. He really doesn't have a huge amount of health either, it's just a matter of surviving his attacks for about 6 or 7 turns. And we're off to the police station after this, which is frankly pretty damn huge on the outside. All those guys that called you a shithead earlier are sitting around in here, so you can have some fun talking to them if you want. This dungeon has a giant dark room in the basement. Honestly, if you use the map, it's not that bad. These dark rooms were a lot worse in the older games. The only sorta of wonky part is that there's a specific teleporter you have to enter, specifically from the south, to progress further. The NPCs apparently clue you into this, but again, if you can't read, well, that does a whole lot of nothing for you. If you're following the English script, it lets you know about this, but I just wanted to point it out to save you the headache. Really, besides this dark room, there's not too much. You hit the top, the police chief gives you a little speech, and then he turns into a demon. So wait, he actually is a demon? Shit, that says a lot about the state of this town, doesn't it? He's not nearly as hard as Orgon Ghost, but he has the ability to reflect magic attacks. Be mindful of this, don't accidentally kill yourself. Really, I wish I had more to say about bosses like this, but there just isn't much. I was pulling these fights off with nowhere close to a full party, so as long as you're paying attention and acting accordingly, it usually goes off pretty easily. Unless this is your first Megami Tensei game, you won't have much trouble. Now, a lot of these dungeons might sound kinda samey, right? I don't know. I actually like the dungeons in this game because they don't overstay their welcome. It's like I said earlier, you can polish one of these off in like 20 or 30 minutes, and you feel like you made a little progress. I would have liked more interesting gimmicks like the art museum, but I guess you can't have that sort of thing in every level. I do appreciate that thus far, the dungeons never really devolved into slogs. Some of them are a bit lengthier, but they never feel annoying or anything. Well that's a good thing because this next dungeon sucks actual ass. I guess every game has to have one of these, right? I mean, it's like a quota, a standard that has to be met. It isn't ever a Megami Tensei game until there's at least one dungeon that is less fun than emasculating yourself with a spoon, and don't ever let anyone tell you otherwise. <sighs> okay, let's get this out of the way. The next dungeon is Chinatown. If you walk around in here for about two seconds, you'll realize that every hallway, every inch of this place looks the exact same. I refuse to believe that someone could navigate this without having the map up their ass 99% of the time. Maybe that's the point of this dungeon, but that doesn't make it fun. Another fun-filled feature of this dungeon is that there are many, many teleports for you to step on. And you know how when you step on one of these things you get audio and video feedback, like it plays a little sound and the screen fades out? Well, it doesn't in here. 
Yeah, you get basically no feedback on when you teleport. So you could be walking down a hallway and suddenly just be in another one. Usually you can notice a switch, but sometimes you might not. You're going to be pausing a lot and checking the map over and over and over. Pay attention when you're walking around, this isn't one that you can just mindlessly explore by any means. The thing is though, sometimes you do get that little animation when you teleport, so what's the fucking point? Did they just throw darts at a board to decide which teleports give you a visual clue? Like, what kind of idea even is that? It's something so minuscule, yet at the same time, oddly frustrating. The map is a decent size, and that's not helped by the fact that you get bounced around like a fucking pinball, so you'll be in here for a while. This place definitely wears out its welcome pretty quickly, and it's one of those that by the end, you'll just feel tired and probably want to put the game down for a while. This is the only dungeon that I can say just really was not fun. It's not nearly as bad as like the Domain of Sloth, but it's not exactly pleasant either. Oh yeah, and the boss is pretty easy, just uh, hit him. You don't need buffs or anything, just go balls out on him and he'll go down. Of course, arguably, the boss here was the mental anguish of such a large teleport maze, so maybe they wanted to go a little easy on us. After the hellscape vanishes, Chinatown looks a little more like a place that wasn't designed by a being of pure hatred, disguised as a game developer. You get paid by this dude, and he introduces you to his American friend, Cooper Smith. Oh shit. I mean, look at the hat, you can just tell he's American. Remember when I mentioned that the weapons shop was in the sewers a while ago? Well, you can go there now with the ID card you get. It's in the first sewer you unlock, so check it out if you get the chance. Apparently, the weapons don't really stack up to what you can get in normal shops or in dungeons, so it's up to you, but it's a neat little bonus for completing the dungeon. So, back at base, Ray comes up with a little theory. The location of the seals that Sid Davis and the gang are trying to break almost form a pentagram if you draw lines between them. So the last place we need to go is Hibarigo Aka to break into the Yakuza's very own mansion. Gendo Mansion is a pretty neat place. You actually do fight guys with swords and uh, gangsters with Tommy guns. Of course, we're pretty late in the game now, so this one starts to slap on the shit. Lots of pitfalls, a pretty big dark room, and a few no comp areas. No comp places really just kind of suck because you can't look at your map, so make sure you cast the mapper spell beforehand so you at least have something to go off of. I'm not sure if Chinatown was still lingering in my mind, but I found this dungeon to be sort of frustrating. Like earlier, if I ran into a pitfall or something, it'd be no big deal. I mean, the dungeons have to have some tricks along the way somewhere or else they'd be kind of boring. At this point though, I just really wasn't feeling patient with the game and every time I'd fall into a lower floor, I'd die a little bit on the inside. At least this dungeon has some cool music and a pretty neat theme though. When you reach the boss room, you get to fight this Dracula looking ass Yakuza boss. He can use some almighty attacks and poison you, but again, as long as you're not playing blindfolded, you're not gonna have much trouble. We get to see Sid for a second too, and he's all like, you have outlived your usefulness, and then he lets the guy die. After that, you get shat back out onto the street. I imagine it was kind of awkward when you and Ray went all the way back through the dungeon, having just killed all these guys' boss, but oh well. Back at the detective agency, Kumiko's parents have returned, and she's gone missing again. They say she's somewhere in the Chuo district, so that's where we're gonna go. But first, I did a little bit of fusion. I managed to make an Anubis, who has some decent MP, and is at least a little more powerful than what we've been scrounging up so far. With our new demon, we hit up Chuo, and we're going to City Hall. City Hall is one of those places that is not shy about sticking it all the way up your ass. Besides the usual array of traps, we've also got some particularly cruel one-way doors where you're basically thrown 5 or 10 minutes back and have to redo decent sized portions of the dungeon if you're not careful. Man, I don't really know what to say about these kind of things. Like, is it good game design because they tricked you like that? Or is it bad because it's really annoying? I feel like the game sort of spends the last 15 hours buttering you up with these easy, simple dungeons, and then right here in the final quarter of the game, it just says fuck butter and it pours salt in your eyes or something. I mean, all I can say is when you're exploring these places, be as mindful as you can. If you're careful, you might miss out on some traps, but odds are, at least once, you're gonna have to redo part of a dungeon. There's not much else you can do but push through. Yeah, also, this place has those warps where it doesn't give you any indication that you just warp to. It's nowhere near as bad as Chinatown, but it's something to be aware of. The boss here takes it up to 11, because before we're fighting like little ghosts and angry spirits, right? 
Yeah, well now you're gonna fight fucking Demiurge. Isn't this guy like the final boss of a few games? Well anyway, now he's in City Hall. And man, can he hit like a truck. He can hit you with a lot of status ailments, including stone, which kills you instantly. I ended up getting through this one by buffing my magic a little bit and going hard with spells like Megiddo. If you have the spell Megiddo, you can really kick ass. It only costs like 7 MP and it does a decent bit of damage. Any buffs would be nice for this fight, especially defense ones. He can't remove buffs, though he can remove any debuffs placed on him. So just hang in there and eventually he'll go down. So Demiurge is down. Sid Davis mentioned that Kumiko had already been taken away to some other dimension, the Astral Plane. Ray says we can go there, but she's got to use some magic to send us there. So it's going to be another solo job. Let's not waste any time then. I mean, we can handle this on our own, right? We did it before. I was pretty interested in seeing how this was going to go, but about three seconds into the dungeon, Kyoji's ghost shows up. He says he's ready to settle the score with Sid, and well, we can save Kumiko in the process. That's right, for this dungeon, we get to have Kyoji on our team. Shit yeah man, two summoners kicking ass, just like old times. You know, the day we both died. This place is pretty funky, so it loops. If you go far enough to one end, you'll be back where you started before eventually. Kyoji has a decent selection of spells to help you out, so he can fill pretty much any role that Rei might have been filling as long as he's with you. One thing to note is that this entire place is a no comp zone, but Kyoji has a spell that allows you to summon demons. So really, the only thing you're missing out on here is a map. Mostly, this place is pretty easy. There's a few warps, but that's about it. It's kind of a breath of fresh air, and after the marathon of Chinatown and City Hall, I was welcoming it. At the end, Sid's like losing his shit. I mean, he really wants that book. He's trying to convince Kumiko to give it to him, but luckily the two coolest men alive break into the room to stop him. Sid is literally the easiest boss in all of creation. I think he's even weaker than the first encounter with him back at the university. Compared to Demiurge, this guy is practically nothing. After this, you get to talk to Kumiko for a few seconds. She finally realizes that I'm in Kyoji's body, and you get to have a little heart to heart. She reveals that the book Sid is looking for is sitting in a coin locker near the detective agency, and that the password is her birthday, right under our noses this entire time. So it's time to head back, except, well, Kyoji. You know, this guy, he's, he's dead. He says right when you think he's going to be noble or selfless, he flat out tells you that he's taken his body back and you can go die. I mean, to be fair, it is his body, but shit, I've been using it for like a few days, so it's basically mine now, right? But yeah, he really does tell you to go die. We meet Sharon again, and before we know it, we're sitting in a Vichy hell, which is like the lowest possible hell you can go to in Buddhism. Why are we this far down? We weren't even that bad in real life. This place is for like, you know, violent criminals. And just look at it, it's another one of these fleshy red looking places. Every game I've talked about on this channel so far has one of these. SMT If has the stomach level, and Megami Tensei has the rotting sea of flames that actually looks like the rotting somebody's colon. Here we are again, you know, one of these long forgotten flesh caves, never to escape. It turns out escaping hell isn't actually that hard. The encounters here are strange. Sometimes you'll get some demons that are reasonably powerful, and sometimes it'll be Pretas or some other demons that are from the very start of the game. This place is one big warp maze, but thankfully it's only one floor, and there aren't any other big obstacles to worry about. You can talk to some of these guys wandering around, and they mention that at one point they used to be humans, but they've been here for so long that they turned into demons. Huh. So, are all demons like that? You gotta wonder. When you reach Sharon, he asks if you'd like to return to your body. This part's fucking hilarious. I actually laughed when this happened. Obviously, like, yeah, that's what I want to do, Sharon. Good guess. So I said yes, and what do you think happened? He said I couldn't do that, and I was teleported back to the beginning of the dungeon. Classic shit, man. Alright, well, at least it isn't that long, I guess. Like, you know the guy who put that in the game? He was cackling like a madman as he wrote that code. Anyway, don't say yes unless you want to waste your time. Because you said no, Sharon thinks you're some kind of honorable person and gives you a bunch of tidbits of info. For one, he tells you that your death was apparently part of a plan for Kyoji to continue his duties as a devil summoner. After Kyoji died, he decided someone needed to take his place, so in a sense, Sid Davis murdering us was intentional. Shit, dude. 
Kyoji isn't just a dick, he's literally a sociopath. He had my ass killed, we did all that work, and then he kicked us down into hell. Kyoji actually chimes in for a second too. He's surprised you escaped from the bottom of hell, but he's having a little bit of technical difficulties getting back into his body. Turns out he's been dead for too long. So Sharon sends us back to his body instead, and Kyoji is basically speechless. I might feel bad for him, but well, I did just crawl out of hell because of him. Twice. Alright, so it looks like we're finally going back then. We wake up, still in City Hall, and Ray says that a lot's happened. Kumiko left, and I was laying there screaming in my sleep. We gotta hit up that coin logger before shit gets really crazy. So the coin lockers are pretty close to the detective agency. You head into an unmarked door and you have to pick the right combo, of which there are only four choices. I'm not sure what happens if you get it wrong, probably nothing, but Kumiko's birthday is January 31st. The combo is 0130. We crack her open and find the book. Inside is a riddle that we can use to find the next dungeon. Well, I had to rely on the script for this one. It's basically like a play on words in Japanese, so there's a fat chance you're going to find it out naturally if you don't know the language. Of course, it does mention going beneath the earth, and there was a place I talked about earlier kind of like that. Any ideas? Were you thinking of the sewer? Because yeah, that's it. But it's not just any sewer, it's the ones beneath Hibari Gaoka. According to the script, the kanji for Hibari means skylark, and the book also mentions birds, so under the earth, place with birds, Hibari Gaoka sewer. Honestly, pretty cool detective work. I wonder how they'd translate this into an English riddle. Anyway, we have to go see Sid first and let him know that we found the damn thing, and he says if we can do exactly as the book says, he'll let Kumiko go. Sure, you know, how bad can it be? So, the sewers. I mentioned these were kind of boring. They are. They're also just a little confusing, so if you've been slacking on exploring these in your free time, they can seem pretty vast. All of the sewers around the city are interconnected, so you can actually wander from, say, where we are now to a different one in a different section of town. If you're not familiar with the layout, you may not realize that's what's happening, and you'll also be exploring the totally wrong place looking for something that isn't there. You might run into our old pal Dr. Thrill again too. The Hee Ho brothers are also floating around. There's honestly a lot of shit going on in these sewers, it's like a whole ass party down here. When you get to the lowest part of the sewer, the 5th basement, it's a no comp zone. So navigate the floor as best as you can, and eventually you'll be heading back up to the 3rd floor on a different side. You enter this ancient looking room, and there's a giant plug in the middle of the place. Pull that shit out, and the water starts flowing. After that, you get the nice privilege of walking all the way back out, so enjoy that. Well, we're getting really close to the end by now. There's only two dungeons left, technically one as it's like two jammed together. Whew, I mean shit, you know, it's been a lot of work so far. We're gonna really need to prepare for this next one. I pulled out all the stops here at the very end, the 11th fucking hour fusion marathon. It's a good thing this version of the game has a compendium, because I abused the shit out of it. I had a very meager selection of demons, as you know. Just a few to pick from. Well, it took 45 minutes, but I greatly expanded that list by fusing and rebuying demons over and over. Turns out when you barely summon for the entire game, you're going to be left with a lot of magnetite to use for this kind of thing. I had over 200,000, probably enough to summon Lucifer himself, so yeah, I was going crazy just making as many demons as I could so that I could fuse a decent team. I ended up with a pretty stacked roster including Athena, Black Mariah, Ganesha, and Kresnik. Athena has a great selection of healing and revival spells, Ganesha has a pretty powerful melee attack, and Black Mariah has good magic too. I fused a couple of other guys for backup. A couple had buff spells like Iluyanka who could buff our attack. Yeah, we're ready to mess some shit up. Or at least, that's what I thought. You'll see what I mean in a bit. It's kind of a struggle. Before you go, make sure to stock up on items. Get some stuff to cure paralysis and poison. You likely have spells for that at this point, but if it comes down to it, you can offer decent support with your own character by just tossing items at people that need them. When you think you're ready, head over to the park in the Chuo district. To get to the dungeon and save Kumiko, we gotta go through this forest first. 
Well, fear not. The devs decided to give us yet another breather, so they really lowball you with this place. It's pretty much the easiest dungeon ever made. You got some damage floors, but that's basically it. Very short dungeon, and it's essentially just like a formality to get us started with a real shit show down below. So we make it to the center of the park. Sid and Kumiko are there. Sid agrees to his end of the deal, and he lets her go. But Kumiko, seemingly hypnotized, walks down into this ancient tomb that opened up in the park. Sid follows, and so do we. Alright, let's take a deep breath. This is the last time we're going to have to deal with a crazy ass dungeon before the game's over, so let's go out with a bang. The ancient tomb is pretty damn huge, and as you might imagine, is essentially a big, nasty amalgamation of everything we've faced so far. You got some cruel tricks waiting for you here if you aren't careful. There are warps that take you back to the entrance, one-way doors that send you halfway back through the level, teleport mazes similar to City Hall or Chinatown, conveyor floors that shoot you around the place, all of our favorites, and one big family reunion. If you've made it this far, you can do it. It's just all about perseverance. This dungeon also boasts two powerful mini-bosses. One, Yasuo Magatsuhi, can absorb magic and hit you with ailments. Blast him with almighty spells or hit his ass with a sword. Each of these guys has health in the range of 4,000, which is sorta high, but hey, this is the last dungeon after all. Hopefully, you fuse a nice team of demons to help you out. Uh, yeah, so about that. I kind of forgot about the loyalty mechanic at the very end, so essentially what I have here is this big dysfunctional group of highly powerful demons that 70% of the time tell me to shove it up my ass and cast whatever spells they want. Fortunately, Ganesha was one of those demons that gains loyalty from being given presents, so I gave him a shitload of life stones, and we were really tight after that. Athena gained loyalty from being used in battle, so after a lot of random encounters, she became much more trustworthy. The other guys though, yeah, they never really listened. That doesn't mean they didn't help though. Sometimes these demons are only concerned with keeping themselves alive, so they'll cast a healing spell on the party or a buff. Funny enough, a favorite pastime that emerged amongst my party was committing suicide. Yeah, so a lot of these later game demons seem to have the spell Rakarmdra. Basically what that does is heal the entire party fully at the cost of the caster's life. So like, I'd get a, the smallest scratch, a literal paper cut of like 10 HP of damage, and as soon as that demon got the chance to move, it was almost always the suicide option. I guess they'd rather just be dead than listen to what I have to say. Of course, I was able to revive them afterwards, and this repeated up until the end of the game. Anyway, bottom line, make sure your guys have some loyalty, otherwise you might be running around the final dungeon with a group of rebellious demons with manic depression. The other boss, Omagatsuhi, is similar, though he's more focused on physical attacks. Buff yourself, hit him with magic, you get the idea by now. To me, he was slightly harder than the other one, but still perfectly doable. Alright, after these guys, it's just a little bit further. One place we have to deal with next is this giant room full of identical corridors and teleports. This is like the last fuck you. Be very careful about what doors you go through here, because you can end up losing a lot of progress via one-way doors. You pretty much just gotta experiment with these teleporters. Enter them from all sides because sometimes if you enter it from a different side, it takes you to a different place. It's just trial and error and it's really not that fun, but I will admit it is satisfying to finally finish off what is essentially the last big challenge of the game. You reach one last floor where the encounter rate is through the roof and then you find the final boss door. This is the point of no return. We're about to fight three bosses consecutively with no breaks or healing between. Get your demons out and fully healed, make sure you have everything you need, and save your game. You head in and Sid is waiting, ready to revive the ancient princess Inaruna to unleash her hatred onto the city. As it turns out, Kumiko is directly related to her, and Sid plans to use her to reincarnate the princess. The seals are all removed, and we're too late. Kumiko's energy gets lifted up, the seals bust, and Sid's fucking clothes rip off as he turns into some satanic version of the Incredible Hulk. Shit, well for all that, Sid is still easy as hell. This guy never really learns any new tricks. He's literally all show. He has a bit more health, but besides that, this fight is a total pushover. The only advice I have is to not go too hard here. 
conserve your MP and try to keep your HP high. Just be a little cautious, but also try to beat him as quickly as you can. Trust me, it won't take that long. Finally, after beating him, Sid is defeated, but don't celebrate just yet. Inaruna appears in the aftermath, and she lets us know that she's still just as pissed off as she was like a thousand years ago. Whew, okay, well, let's check this out. She can deal some pretty serious damage. Make sure you cast whatever buffs you've got, and keep everyone's health as high as you can. Her normal attack can hit multiple times, and if it's all on the same demon, it can easily kill them. She's also got some multi-hit elemental spells and an almighty attack. It's still nothing too serious, but it ramps up the challenge from Sid a lot. Her health is actually close to what Sid's was, so she goes too pretty quickly. Essentially, as long as you're not having demons being killed off in one turn by that physical attack, you'll be fine. If that does happen, just be sure to revive them as quick as you can. After you weaken her enough, Inaruna turns into this giant, weird-ass mass of tentacles with a deer head and a human body. To be honest, this looks cool as shit. The final boss music also kicks in, so you know it's serious this time. Can we talk about this theme for a second? Check this shit out. It doesn't really sound like your average final boss theme, does it? I've heard some people say that it sucks, and I mean, to be fair, it doesn't really hold a candle to a lot of the other game's impressive boss themes. But to be honest, I love this theme, and I think it perfectly fits for a game like Devil Summoner. It has this menacing, confident tone to it. Like, have you ever really felt in danger this entire game? Maybe what, like once or twice? Exactly, man. You're a fucking Devil Summoner. You're the most badass person in the city, and that's what this theme sounds like. Like, this is the wrap-up to another day in the office. It almost reminds me of, like, the end fight scene to an action cartoon or something. If you look at it that way, I think it's a pretty memorable boss theme. Alright, crack your knuckles, let's do this shit and finish this game. Inaruna takes the gloves off on this part. You can get your ass kicked here, and there are a few particularly deadly moves you need to look out for. First, it's important to know that her health has been doubled from around 2,500 to 5,000. This battle is going to be on the longer side. She's got moves like Spite Shout that can paralyze your entire team, and she can also charm you. Break out those items as soon as you get hit with an ailment. Try to have a backup demon that can heal this kind of thing too. The worst move she has is called Crying Scream, and that's exactly what you'll be doing if it manages to hit you. This move can turn you to stone. So if you and Ray get hit with that shit, well, you're fucking dead. Game over. It happened to me a few times, and yeah, it's pretty shitty. Inaruna also has the most powerful almighty spell in the game, and she can cancel out buffs and debuffs. For me, this was indeed a long battle, a slow endurance round, chipping away, praying to god that I don't get turned into a statue and have to do it all over again. Slowly, I was running out of resources. My poison and paralysis curatives were running low, because I was having bad luck getting hit by ailments. As the battle raged on, my demons were one by one getting picked off. Athena came in clutch with the healing for most of it, but eventually she too was killed off. As my last demon went down, I kinda laughed at myself because I realized that once again, it was down to me and Rey to finish this thing off. Just like at the beginning of the game, and for many fights after that, it was that iconic duo kicking ass and taking names. It was like we had come full circle, you know? It just had to end like this. At this point, I was just throwing life stones and beads at Rey, and she was slapping the shit out of her with almighty attacks. Every once in a while, I'd sneak in a sword strike. There were quite a few times where Crying Scream got casted, and every time I'd clench my fucking nuts, but we lucked out and didn't get hit. After a particularly intense couple of minutes of keeping Rey strong enough to keep dealing the damage, Inaruna finally went down, and the tomb faded away. Inaruna, speaking seemingly through Kumiko, apologizes and thanks you for returning her to her sanity. Kumiko comes to and realizes that we saved her. Not Kyoji, but you know, us. In a bittersweet moment, she realizes that this is who I am now. I can't switch bodies back, and I have to live on as Kuzanoa. She says this isn't goodbye, but rather, until we meet again. Then Kyoji appears in Takashi's body and he's like, hey, yeah, you can keep my body until you mess up, then you're going back to hell. Thanks, Kyoji. 
The final dialogue from Ray is a pretty neat way to end the game. We finally did it, the day is saved. Ray says you're perfectly worthy of being called a Kuzunoha, but since you aren't Kyoji, she asks what she should call you and you get a dialogue choice. You can either choose to live on as Kyoji Kuzunoha, or you can just keep being you. There's no merit to either choice, it's totally up to you. I think it's a pretty interesting choice to stick in at the very end like that. Like, were you doing all of it because you were trying to be like Kyoji, or did you really have it in you the entire time? It's shit like this that keeps you up at night. And... that's it for Devil Summoner. This was a long journey, spinning about a month in real life for me. Regardless, this was always a game I was excited to play when I turned it on. It really has this signature sense of charm to it. A lot of stuff in this game just felt fun and novel. The setting and premise is kinda goofy, but the game never really takes itself that seriously anyway. If you're a fan of classic Mega Ten games and you want something familiar but also a little different, this is an excellent game to check out if you haven't. And if you're in it for the long haul and can put up with reading off a script, I'd actually totally recommend someone start out the Devil Summoner series with this game. It's not at all hard to get through outside of a few dungeons and the occasional boss fight, and to be honest, I bet even the most casual players could probably find their way through this with minimal trouble. Again, there are some dungeons that do drag on, and the fact that there are many instances of text with no translation is a downside for those who don't know how to read it. In my case, I was able to read all the menus and dialogue choices, but this is because I've been studying the language for a few years. I can imagine this being really annoying if you haven't been doing that, though it isn't impossible to figure out. Every important choice is explained in the script, so really it's just more incidental stuff like being able to read a demon's name or the name of a sword or an item. If you're the kind of person who wants to be able to read everything in a game you're playing, you might not like it in its current state, but if you're willing to fumble around a little bit and experiment and try to logic your way through things, I highly recommend it. It's hard for me to hold the language of a game against it because, well, it's not really a flaw. My personal ranking would be a high B tier or a low A tier game for the PSP version. At the very least, I do think it's worth downloading and messing around for a few minutes. Out of all the games not to be translated yet, it's honestly a shame that it has to be this one. Well, as always, if you watch to the end, I really appreciate it. This was my Devil Summoner experience, and I hope it gets some of you guys to check the game out and discuss it with your friends. Who knows, I mean, maybe our interest will be noticed and we'll see a translation of the game appear someday. A man can dream, I guess. Let me know what you think about this game in the comments if you played it, and I'll see you guys in the next video.